We are friends united. We are friends united. We are friends united. Together, we are friends united. Tell me about how you came to know about this place. Well, I was invited by Rolf to come and see the center. Um, just, I just moved here 2020, during the middle of the, the, the start of the COVID. And when things settled down, he invited me to come and see the place and told me the story behind how he was supporting Indigenous art, artists in the region. Um, and later on, he invited me again to meet Eric. Um, Eric Schweig. Yeah, and um, little did he know that we were related. You used the word unbelievable, and I think that that is a really important use of language because I think a lot of Canadians felt this is unbelievable. But then the graves were, the well, the lack of graves, the, you know, children found who weren't given proper burials, and not just once. And then all of a sudden it was believable to Canadians. I think that was a, a horrific turning point, but a turning point. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I think so. I, I mean, you know, what's shocking to me, like part of this, when that became the news, it's, I think as Indigenous people, it's as we've always known that, you know, and, and the rest of Canadians, you know, they now believe us. Right. Um, I mean, that's exactly, I think, what happened. And That's why I thought that word so, was key. It's, yeah, it's so unreal. It's so unbelievable that it's not believable. But I think through this process of discovery, um, Canadians are realizing, and I say this, it, it is our collective history as Canadians. It's not my history. It's all of our history. Mm. Um, and I think that's really, really important in that we have to embrace um, you know, are the good, the bad, and the ugly of our collective history. And the culpability. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, recently I did a presentation at the school, my son's grade 8 class, one of the classes in grade 8 here in town, and it was on a uh, residential school. And I was supposed to be there for an hour. I ended up being there for three hours and just talking to the kids. And I, and I wanted the kids to be comfortable to be able to answer or ask any question. I, just ask me anything because it's so important for the generation to know, to know the truth, to know what happened in our country, to know what happened in your backyards. And it was shocking to me, um, the educators didn't know. And we put our hands and faith in, in the teachers to teach history. And that's a piece that uh, is a huge missing link in, in their system today. And um, I think if we're going to not repeat this again and reconcile going forward, we need to go forward in, in a way that we have a common understanding of what transpired over the years to Indigenous people in this country. And, you know, the day that um, Prime Minister Harper issued an apology in the House of Commons, I was, um, I think, the health minister for Nunavut at the time, pregnant with my son. And sitting there, listening to, to Harper's apology and the response from Indigenous leaders, I was quite emotional because finally, finally, um, we have a leader in this country that's embracing the wrongdoing to a population of Canadians. Um Rodney, I'm wondering when you were premier, you would have had lots of uh, interaction with Indigenous people and heard many stories. Were you surprised, shocked by what came out in terms of stories at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or had you heard a lot of it before? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I've heard some of them, you know, stories over the years, of course, uh, but I, I'm mesmerized by just listening to Leona's story. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and I can see the, it, you can see it and hear it in, in, in your voice and, and see it in your expression as you talk about it. Uh, and I think every time you hear a story, it, it, uh, it impacts a person. 
uh, as you were talking, I, I was thinking about a friend of mine I went to school with, and he talks about his older siblings and the fact that um, uh, I think it was government officials that had come to the house to, to, to take them off to residential schools. And uh, their, his parents had gotten the kids to go up uh, around the mountain in the woods to hide during the process yeah. and actually avoid it being taken at the time. And I think other family members. So when I hear th things like that, and I would hear that in government and, and hear now um, post-government, or it's, it still impacts the person I, it, it, because it's unbelievable what, uh, what, uh, what people went through. And, and uh, the loss of language and the loss of culture and identity in a lot of ways. Welcome, Gwe. This is the Friends United International Convention Centre in Unamagi, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for joining us for our second annual Friends United Reconciliation Talks. I'm thrilled today to be joined by the Honourable Leona Aglukuk and the Honourable Rodney MacDonald. There is a lot of honour in this conversation <laughs> right now, but you, you've both told me I can I can feel free to call you by your first names. That's me. For yeah. sure. So I really appreciate that. Leona Rodney is very familiar with the Friends United Center because he's been really part of building it over the years and sits on the board. And you've been fairly recently introduced. Tell me about how you came to know about this place. Well, I was invited by Roth to come and see the center. Um, just. I just moved here 2020, during the middle of the, the, the start of the COVID. And when things settled down, he invited me to come and see the place and told me the story behind how he was supporting Indigenous art artists in the region. Um, and later on, he invited me again to meet Eric. Um, Eric Schweig. Yeah, and um, little did he know that we were related. And the story behind Eric's upbringing and my upbringing, there's some similarities, which I'll touch on in a little bit. But Eric didn't know that we were related. And Roth is sitting there and looking at us and trying to figure out like, <laughs> what is going on here and not knowing that he introduced two long lost cousins that were both given up for adoption. Amazing. Wow. That is a form of reconciliation right there. Isn't that interesting? Tell me about your background, please. Start, start from the beginning. Uh, oh, I was adopted um, by Charlie and Mary Magluka of Tom Bay at the time, which is a region of the Kitikmute region west of Nunavut. Um, I was born in Inuvik to uh, my mo biological mother is Ida Bennett. Um, she was in residential school at the time when I was born and given up for adoption and transported to a town called Spence Bay. Can I ask just, so it, it's probably obvious, but she had no choice. She had a choice. Oh, she did have a choice. She had a choice um, from the stories I've heard after I met her over the years was that um, her mother had passed of tuberculosis and her father was raising the four kids on his own and um, so my understanding was that she had a choice to keep me or give me up. And she chose to give me up, but story goes that uh, her father was not aware at the time that she gave me up and she was about 16. So the question on consent uh, over the years has been one that's not really talked about or resolved yet. But the family that raised me, wonderful parents, 
Um, they adopted total six children uh, from different backgrounds throughout the North and the children they adopted had very similar backgrounds of being born to mothers of residential school. And um, so the story with my parents, um, you know, their first daughters, seven years older than me, um, and was, she was adopted from my mother's older sister. And at the age of four, uh, my sister was taken to residential school in a town I was born. So I look at um, this whole thing around reconciliation and uh, residential school system on the impact it had on my parents as a family that wanted so desperately to have a family of their own and adopted a child and only to lose her for at the age of four for seven years. And so the experience of myself and my siblings is, is a little bit different in that the school systems were changing over time. Um, she was born in the 50s, I was born in the 60s, and my other brother was born in the 70s. So we were uh, sent to different residential schools. Um, different policies were in place in terms of how those institutions would be managed. So the impact it had had on us as a family um, would be a little bit different. But the common theme in that we were taken from our homes. And I mean, it's not just my mother, biological mother, aunts, uncles, brothers, siblings, it's, that's, I mean, our experience varied. Um, but I look at it in the, from my mother's eyes sometimes, and I wonder, you know, the whole adoption process and the impact on her, like she worked so hard to adopt children, and then the institution um, was not in her favor to raise the children that she wanted so desperately. And then to find out over the years that one of the children that she had adopted was one of the 60s Scoops children. Um, and, you know, my mother took us in as um, through love and through the process thinking it was all right. Mm -hmm. um, but to also learn that one of the children was um, one of the 60s Scoops and the impact and the guilt and that impacts her that way as well. So, um, so when I say about reconciliation and experience, and I take it to that level, because I think reconciliation on the impacts it had starts with family, mm -hmm. and how we learn from it and go forward uh, as a family is very important. Um, I mean, there's a broader issue of um, how Canada is dealing with it, but um, you, you have to start there and be comfortable with um, that story and to be able to tell it and to share it and hope that we don't repeat it again. Um, so that's kind of the start of that reconciliation piece. But as an adopted child and, you know, to two wonderful parents, um, the children that they, we, we were all from different backgrounds, um, but I never felt that we were from different backgrounds. We were treated fairly and we were loved and we were fed and clothed, and we were given what they could afford and what could they could provide in the, in the Arctic when um, there was limited resources at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, we're close. We're a huge family now. Um, my mother has over 100 grandchildren and great-grandchildren oh. from the six that she has adopted. Oh, my goodness. So in that way, it's... Um, it's a very happy family. It's a huge family and from a couple that couldn't have children. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And of those children in your family that went to residential school, you know, of course the idea, uh, and this is horrific to all of us now that we've really been awakened to it through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and a lot of Canadians hold shame, I think, and guilt for not understanding as deeply before what was going on, but the idea was to strip you of your culture and your language and your, your history. Um, do you see that having happened in the family members that you have who went to residential school? Um, like I said earlier that, you know, our experience 
depending on the year that you were born and taken, varies, right? My sister was very young. She was four years old and was gone for a long time. Uh, when she came back, she did not have her language. Um, but when I went to residential school, I was 13, and I had my language mm -hmm. already from home. Um, and then my siblings. Um, so it affected, you know, where my sister went, you know, you're not allowed to speak your language. She's four years old. You're not allowed to interact with your family that is also in that residential school. And it was quite strict and it was operated by the churches at the time. And then where I went to residential school, I went to a government operated residential school. So the restrictions on interaction with your siblings or your brothers that may be in one dorm, like we were not controlled in that way. Um, we were allowed to make phone calls to our parents once a week and see family that came to the community. So the restriction that um, was felt by students that went to um, church-operated schools um, was less that in the government-operated system. Of course, there were rules um, to be at home at a certain time, to study, to go to school, and so forth. It was very structured, um, but there was no drive where I went that we had to be at church, we had to go by the Bible and so forth, which my sister's experience was, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of education, but at the same time, the exposure of the church. So it varies. Mm -hmm. And that's a common story for many people that went to those two different operating systems. Um, Rodney, I'm wondering when you were premier, you would have had lots of uh, interaction with Indigenous people and heard many stories. Were you surprised, shocked by what came out in terms of stories at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or had you heard a lot of it before? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I've heard some of them, you know, stories over the years, of course. Uh, but I, I'm mesmerized by just listening to Leona's story. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and I can see the... It, you can see it and hear it in, in, in your voice and, and see it in your expression as you talk about it. Uh, and I think every time you hear a story, it, it, uh, it impacts a person. Uh, as you were talking, I, I was thinking about a friend of mine I went to school with, and he talks about his older siblings and the fact that um, uh, I think it was government officials that had come to the house to, to, to take them off to residential schools. And uh, their, his parents had gotten the kids to go up uh, around the mountain in the woods to hide during the process yeah. and actually avoid it being taken at the time. And I think other family members. So when I hear th things like that, and I would hear that in government and, and here now um, post-government, or it's, it still impacts the person I, it, because it's unbelievable what, uh, what, uh, what people went through. And, and uh, the loss of language and the loss of culture and identity in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I can't imagine. And you see it from different perspectives with your, with your siblings. Yeah. And uh, from a very unique position, something that really someone like myself can't even really begin to comprehend. Mm -hmm. I think of my grandmother. My grandmother's parents died as a, as a young person. And... Uh, She's not, she wasn't, you know, an Aboriginal Canadian, but she did lose her language and she did lose part of her cultural identity. At the age of four, went to school and that's it. No more, you know, no more speaking your language, you're going to learn English. Yeah. But she and went her home. language was Gaelic? Her language was Gaelic. Yeah. But, you know, she, she went home to, she was raised by her, her, her aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she went home at night. Right. So she, you know, obviously was educated through the, you know, but through the school system, which was run by the sisters at the time, uh, and but lost language and that sort of thing. And that's a small tidbit of what you would have, like just a, a piece of what what you would have went through. So I can't imagine that. And and uh, you know, finally, at least it's being talked about in the last number of years more openly. And the fact that you're saying this and talking about it uh, and 
you know, for your kids and, you know, and, you know, generations after they'll, they'll hear this and, and that's going to be a real eye opener for them down the road. So I, I think this is a, you know, it's important that, uh, that this be taking place. Yeah. You use the word unbelievable. And I think that that is a really important use of language because I think a lot of Canadians felt this is unbelievable. But then the graves were, the, well, the lack of graves, the, you know, children found who weren't given proper burials and not just once. And then all of a sudden it was believable to Canadians. I think that was a, a horrific turning point, but a turning point. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I think so. I, I'm, you know, what's shocking to me, like part of this, when that became the news, it's, I think as Indigenous people, it's as we've always known that, you know, and, and the rest of Canadians, you know, they now believe us. Right. Um, I mean, that's exactly, I think, what happened. And that's why I thought it's, that it's word so, was key. It's, yeah, it's so unreal. It's so unbelievable that it's not believable. But I think through this process of discovery, um, Canadians are realizing, and I say this, it, it is our collective history as Canadians. It's not my history, it's all of our history. Mm. Um, and I think that's really, really important in that we have to embrace, um, you know, are the good, the bad, and the ugly of our collective history. And the culpability. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, recently I did a presentation at the school, my son's grade eight class, one of the classes in grade eight here in town, and it was on a uh, residential school. And I was supposed to be there for an hour. I ended up being there for three hours and just talking to the kids. And I, and I wanted the kids to be comfortable to be able to answer or ask any question. I, just ask me anything because it's so important for the generation to know, to know the truth, to know what happened in our country, to know what happened in your backyards. And it was shocking to me um, the educators didn't know. And we put our hands and faith in, in the teachers to teach history. And that's a piece that uh, is a huge missing link in, in our system today. And um, I think if we're going to not repeat this again and reconcile going forward, we need to go forward in, in a way that we have a common understanding of what transpired over the years to Indigenous people in this country. And, you know, the day that um, Prime Minister Harper issued an apology in the House of Commons, I was, um, I think, the health minister for Nunavut at the time, pregnant with my son. And sitting there, listening to, to Harper's apology and the response from Indigenous leaders, I was quite emotional because... Finally, finally, uh, we have a leader in this country that's embracing the wrongdoing to a population of Canadians. And it was an emotional day. Um, and, you know, it's taken this long to get to um, where we are in, on a conversation about what reconciliation means. And, you know, my son is 14 now, right? And that apology took place 14 years ago before the Pope apologized. Mm -hmm. So time goes, time, we've waited 14 years. And now, so what does this going forward look like? How did you feel when the Pope apologized? Um, I mean, I grew up as a Catholic. <laughs> That's a tort. It's, it's, um, I was raised as a Catholic. Um, my parents were Catholic and... So the acknowledgement of the Pope um, was very important for me as any other person because it's, it's the few that did the wrong, right? It's not the faith itself. It's the people that were trusted to um, be good um, leaders in, in the Catholic faith. And... So it's hard to reconcile those at times when um, you know people that have been so wronged by 
representatives of the church. And you know them personally, some are family. Um, so it, to me, it was a huge step for the church to acknowledge that they've done wrong and a lot of harm, not just to Canadians, but globally, there's many stories of this nature in other countries. And the acknowledgement of that institution that there's been many abuse is a huge step for that institution. And they have to deal with that themselves to how do we ensure that this never happens again? You know, you, as a country, we, we have to say that we don't want to repeat what happened. But that church itself and the church, Catholic Church, Anglican Church, they have to do that as well. So what does that look like? I don't know what that would look like in their own process, but um, they have a lot of work, I think, to do around building that trust, that the individuals within the institution and leading are good people. And, you know, they have to deal with the black cloud over that institution. And unfortunately, that happened and the history have happened, but they have a lot of work to do. Senator Dan Christmas was here and sitting in one of these chairs, and he also identifies as a Catholic still. And he, when I asked him, said he felt it was a really good start. He said it felt, you know, he, he was very happy to hear the Pope say that. Um, and he framed it as being a starting point. Uh, as you say, when, when Harper apologized, that was also a very important starting point for our country. Rodney, if you were still in politics, what do you think, and you've probably thought about this, what would be your main focus? Where would you want to start in terms of reconciliation on a governmental level? Oh, wow. Uh, it, it's a very big question because there's so many parts to it and so many moving parts. I, I think you can be premier or prime minister in answering yes. this question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think meeting with the communities and the people that have, you know, that have gone through, uh, that have gone through this or their parents or the generational issue uh, has continued to flow through families. And I, and I think listening is number one. The communication uh, needs to be there. And, uh, you know, so listening to a story like Leonis, as an example, I think puts you in a different perspective as to what should the priority be. Well, I think the first priority is, is listening to people that and hear their ideas uh, because uh, that'll help shape, you know, the policy and it'll help shape the investment or whatever it might be. Um, I, as, as Leona was talking about uh, her story, and, and thinking about perhaps what some of the artists here have gone through in Friends United. I think of, I think of their artwork and I think of any wonder uh, what comes through their artwork is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's often a religious aspect in there. There is, you know, there, there's often uh, that uh, uh, aspect of nature and city. There's, uh, you know, residential school elements flow through, you know, someone like a, a David Brooks. And when you look at his artwork or someone else, uh, there's pain in some of those. There's trauma. Uh, in other ones, there's happiness. And, you know, uh, you know uh, and so there's, there's, there's all different things merge. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why some of these artists are so powerful in their, their, their paintings as well. So one of the things I, as you were asking that question, I, I think about my days as a minister of culture here. And, and perhaps, uh, you know, there were some things we did that were very good, but all the things that I didn't do, that I could have done. And, uh, you know, and, and some of those things would be like, you know, the art bank for, for the Nova Scotia Art Gallery. And the lack of presence that we had in Nova Scotia for that. And the void that not only this initiative, but other initiatives are happening that can help fill a, a large void in Nova Scotia. And the lack of representation we had as a result in our institutions. So, 
You know, I, I think of uh, Laurie Halfpenny McCory, uh, Judge Laurie Halfpenny McCory, and 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 I went that day in the Wagmatuk when when uh, when uh, at the opening of uh, the court there, and and uh, you know the fact that there was artwork all over the place. Seventy pieces. Seventy pieces, and you know, and the premier at that time was Steve McNeil, and and I can honestly say I've never heard him speak so well. He he spoke from the heart, and uh, it was a great initiative all the way around. Friends United were involved, uh, the legal system was involved, the government was there, uh, the chiefs were there, the community was there. Most importantly. And, and I thought to myself, gee, I wish I had done something like that. Yeah. I, wish, uh, I wish that, uh, you know, that I had done a better job around things like the art bank of the representation. So this helped open my eyes in a lot of ways. And, and I think a lot of, you know, government leaders, uh, it has helped open our eyes. So things like this. So visual, I think visuals are important. I, I think it's... Uh, I think the sense of pride it institutes in people. I think the message it sends. I think that uh, it opens doors that where doors were closed at one time. So I, I think, you know, I guess uh, a long way of going around to back to your question about what would I do? That's one of the things I would do. I, I would do, uh, I think I'd do a better job in, in a lot of ways than perhaps I did do, you know? We did some good things too, though. Well, that's it. And hindsight is yeah, right. Hindsight. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. But I, I so agree with you that art is like a universal language. You know, we may speak different languages, but we can communicate through art in a very different way. Mm-hmm. What was your experience the first time you came into this center, Leona? The first time I came into this beautiful place beautiful art, but there's a lot of Inuit art collection here too. Um, And they're on display here. And he also has a display of a book there. It's called the Natsilik Mute Carvings. And I'm from the Natsilik Mute region of Nunavut. Um, And I know all those artists from from my hometown and grew up with them carving. And a lot of time those artists back in the day were carving outside at minus 30. You know, you can be uh, using soapstone and carving in, in indoors. So it's not always pleasant, but a lot did it as well to earn an, uh, an income. Um, so in the 70s, when the community started to form, a lot of people went from living off the land into a community and started with the trade or the fur trade and so forth. So uh, Inuit picked up um, soapstone carving. Um, and women picked up selling sealskin mitts or boots and so forth and tried to adapt to a different kind of economy from, um, from a hunting family uh, providing and so forth. So when you see the Inuit carvings, it's animals, a lot of it's polar bears, seal, birds, whales, and um, majority of those carvings are carved by men who are also hunters. And so you make a little bit of money with what you sell and you buy your gasoline and you go hunting for your family. So that's still practiced to this day because there's not a lot of uh, jobs in our community. And women today are making beautiful um, coats, mitts, and are really taking advantage of technology to market their products. Back in the day was very challenging. We didn't get a lot of tourists to buy our products, so Arctic Cooperative Movement took a lot of filling that gap over the years. But today, the young people are so creative. Um, They're in the international fashion shows in Paris and New York, and these are Inuit women coming from our territory of Nunavut. And when you see their work, it's pride. Um, it's exciting, and a lot of the girls, you know, the young ladies, learn those skills from their mother, who learned those skills from their grandmother, and so forth. So one of the things that was really important to Inuit um, and how we live and work and survived um, was really connected to the seal. And you'll see over here, there's a walrus, and there's seal skin, or seal um, carvings is... The seal was not only our food, um, 
it was our, the fat was our uh, oil for, to heat our homes, mm -hmm. our igloos or our tents. Um, and the seal skin was our clothing, our tent or whatnot. So everything was used. Or earrings. Or earrings. Um, but that's uh, how we survived in the harshest environment in the world. Mm -hmm. With very little, our house was built made of snow in the winter months and summer months was seal skin. And when you look at the um, Inuit people's ability, uh, resilience and survival skills, and I mean, we survived the harshest environment in the world because we knew something. We knew how to survive in the harshest. And you know, you tap into that, you, you wanna learn like how is it that we're not learning from this. And when I got into politics, um, you know, my, my thinking was, you know, what, what can I do to help the Inuit people and what was the wrong that happened to them that affected everyone of us across from Alaska to Canada to northern Quebec, Labrador, and it was the ban on seal hunt. Uh, and that movement was um, really around the Green Peace movement to ban um, seal call around Labrador, but that had a huge impact on the Inuit and indigenous people um, because that was our, our market, that was our only product at the time that we were able to sell and make a little bit of money off to provide for our family. Yes, it would have been devastating. It was devastating. And so, um, so you go from carving and you're trying to sell your products and there was a big black cloud over any product, the way the environmental group like Greenpeace um, um, impacted our, our people. A population of an ethnic group that depended on it was a target. And so one of the first things uh, when I got into federal politics was to um, deal with the European Union ban on Canadian seal products um, and took that to court in the um, international trade process and were able to, uh, we were successful, it took a long time, but we were successful um, in the, the ban around um, marketing indigenous products, um, seal products. What we discovered through that process was that Greenland, which is part of Denmark, they didn't have the restrictions for Danish Inuit people. But European Union had the restrictions to Inuit Canadians. Um, so we're de treated differently in that respect. So we fought it through the courts. Um, and that market is slowly opening up again and you'll see products that are being made whether they're boots or purses or coats um, being sold but I think what people fail to understand is that um, people don't go out there hunting seal for the fur they go hunting for food because a t-bone steak is $65 right it, and it's not our traditional diet so that was one of the things that I pushed really hard during my time in federal government, in federal politics. And for the very first time as well, you know, in the throne speech under Prime Minister Harper, um, there was a, a section in the throne speech that his government would stand up for the seal hunters of, of Canada, Canadians, just like you would for your cod fishermen, lobster fishermen, and your farmers, dairy, and so forth. And my argument has always been is that just because we don't call it a farm, it doesn't mean it's not a sector. Um, and we are Canadians, and we deserve to be um, represented, and someone should be fighting the European Union and their stance on that and, or the Greenpeace and so forth. Um, and the harm that they have done to Indigenous people. And so within that islands, as an Indigenous person sitting around um, the cabinet table, I look at similar strategies around the polar bear hunt or the whale hunt or the caribou. Um, you know, when you talk about reconciliation and when you talk about going forward, um, I look at 
these interest groups that target our food. <laughs> you know, this is, this is our diet, this is our food, and you know, you go down here and you go to your grocery store, your farm. We don't have farms in the Arctic because it's the Arctic. And, and so we've survived eating what's in the Arctic, and that's polar bear, Arctic char, and, and so to this day. Um, but when there's interest groups coming to try and ban polar bear hunt or caribou or um, other species, it's, it's why are they targeting us? Why are they targeting Inuit people? Um, plays on my mind a lot. And I look at it in that lens and always very, um, I don't trust them because of the harm caused by Greenpeace for many, many years. And nobody stood up for us. So you were the first Inuk member of cabinet. Is that right? First, yes. Yes. How did you feel like you were able to deliver these messages when you heard Stephen Harper Talking about that, did you know that was very much because of the impact you had by being at the table? Um, my interest in politics, um, I never really had a party affiliation uh, because coming from uh, Nunavut, we operate under a consensus model of governance. We don't have party politics. Um, here, here. <laughs> Sorry, I say. It. Sometimes it These works. <laughs> Um, but that really shifted for me. Um, I was in, I was in um, the Nunavut cabinet at the time. It shifted for me when I saw uh, Prime Minister Harper and the Conservative Party move on the apology. And it also shifted for me um, that I wanted to be a part of it when I saw what they've developed around their Arctic strategy. And the Arctic strategy um, had f four or five pillars on the environment, on um, supporting the development of the people of the Arctic and so forth. And no government I had seen that had pillars that would move us forward um, when we had so many issues around housing and lack of infrastructure. And, you know, what Canada, you say, we say, you know, coast to coast. It used to be just coast to coast. Mm -hmm. We finally it's, figured out there's another, there's another coast. There's another coast, a very you big must one. Have gone, Hello. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, those, it, it may be just the word coast, but it's huge for us in that there's a huge gap. Um, You're being so, left out. Yeah. And so the shifting to be affiliated that in my mind, to me, aligned with my views of how we were going to move forward. Um, you know, my generation is the last generation that lived off the land and moved into a settlement. And it's my upbringing is different than my parents' upbringing. So uh, we were shifting and going through a lot of change at the time. And um, it just, to me, made sense. Um, was I being around the table make a difference? Absolutely. Um, and being around the table, um, you know, Prime Minister Harper, um, to assign me the portfolio, I'd be the regional minister for the North. Um, I got an opportunity to work along with a lot of my colleagues on many Northern files. And uh, it was an us and them. It was, you know, how do we advance on on building an infrastructure related to ports in Pond Inlet or Iqaluit or, um, so it's, it's working collaboratively, but um, the way it was structured was, um, it wasn't an us and them. And I felt as an indigenous person, the first indigenous Inuk person to be around that table, there was a lot of people watching to see if I would succeed or not. Mm -hmm. And the pressure is there um, but when I was asked to sit around a table, I, I just thought at the time, I'm like, my goodness, I have a lot of work because it was a health portfolio. Um, but very quickly, I was receiving calls from across the country from indigenous groups seeking help. And 
you know, how to advance their issues from BC to right, like west to east. Um, and that was a huge gap right away, I noticed, within the lack of representation they felt they had in the House of Commons. And they were latching on to you, yeah. basically, to say, finally, we've got someone. I think you, you had a bigger impact than you'll ever imagine on people and communities <laughs> uh, of all different communities, too, not just uh, First Nations communities across Canada. I think of all communities and all people. And, uh, you know, imagine the change in like 60 to 60, 70 years from when you were a young you know, girl and being born in the 60s to to today and for, for, to becoming a minister it's uh sometimes i have to pinch myself because yeah. i wonder how did i get here what, but it's what an inspiration though to like young <laughs> girls in your own community Absolutely. i mean that's uh and boys like young girls and boys they they must look at you and just say i can't believe this even you know uh even for your own your own uh son and uh for him to, to uh, have gone through that with you, as we were talking about earlier, <laughs> uh, you know, shortly after he was born and, and you became a minister and yeah. being exposed to all of these things. Yeah. And... Um, he was three months old. Three months old. Yeah. You, you took on a... Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine what you were going through as a, right. a new mom. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you're responsible for, you know, portfolios across the country and and a particular pressure for you in northern uh, uh in northern canada at home yeah. i i can't i can't even imagine what you were someday i'll have to write a book yeah someday um i mean the pressure um the pressure and the responsibility being there being the first was huge in my mind like it's you can only do so much because there's only so many hours a day. Um, and I have a riding that represents 20% of Canada's landmass that covers three time zones and operates in four languages. And it's so unique and with such high areas of needs to catch up to. So a lot of it had, um, you know, you have to balance what you could take on. Um, you know, as you know, it's, yeah. um, but there's only so many days, you know, and hours. Um, but, you know, what I say to the young people is that if I can go from living off the land to this job, you can, anybody, anybody can, can do it. Um, but as Indigenous women in politics, you know, I went through my experience and I saw how Judy Wilson-Raybould was treated. And um, it was, I mean, it's night and day, right? And um, I felt terrible for her and felt for her and the position that she was in. And I felt like, um, in my view, she was used in that and good on her to stand up right? good on her to stand up um, to that pressure um, because she knows the implications of that as an indigenous person in that role and the island you know people are watching um, and she made me very proud of how she handled that I thought she handled it very well given the circumstances that she was put in and discussed it with the leadership. And that's how we were, again, treated as Indigenous people in the system. Um, so we have much work in that area to continue to fight to stand up for what's right. And it's not just the area of residential school reconciliation. It's also playing with the system that's in place to stand up for what's right. Yes. Governance, justice, wellness. Absolutely. So many fronts on which to seek reconciliation. If you were the prime minister, I dub thee <laughs> prime minister. Um, if you were the prime minister, where would you want to start on the on the front of reconciliation? Incorporating um, indigenous knowledge into the decision making process. Um, because I think there's a lot 
of, there's a lot to learn from indigenous people. Um, and, I, and I'm going to use one example of an initiative that um, I had undertaken as Minister of Arctic Council. Um, and Arctic Council represents Alaska, Canada, Denmark, Russia, Greenland, Sweden, Finland, Iceland. And it's Arctic Nations. Um, and that chairmanship of that organization rotates every two years. Um, and I took over that chairmanship when Prime Minister Harper named me as Minister of Arctic Council. And the traditional practice has always been that the chairman for Canada is the foreign minister. And uh, Harper made the decision that it would be someone from the Arctic, born and raised, that would take on that role as opposed to a foreign minister. Um, at that time, he was from Ontario. Um, so when I took it over, um, it's on, it operates on a consensus basis, so we had to come up with what are the priorities we are going to over undertake during our chairmanship um, that would make a difference to the people of the Arctic. And the overarching theme that I was pushing forward was development for the people of the Arctic. As opposed to us being studied from afar, it should be the Arctic contributing to that research for the South. Re just reverse that seat because I think, or that role, I, because I know it would um, deal with some of the conflict between science and researchers with indigenous knowledge. And so one of the initiatives was incorporating indigenous traditional knowledge in research and or science. Um, and, you know, this could be around um, studying climate change, the ice conditions of the Arctic. Um, and a lot of Inuit people, we live there every day, we use the environment every day, we go hunting every day, so we, we know the land well, just like farmers know their land well. We know our area and the temperatures, changing winds and patterns and so forth, that I always felt that they have something to contribute to, to that research. The other big piece was... Um, um, the polar bear population. There's 14 subpopulations of polar bear um, in, in Canada's Arctic. And majority of those subpopulations are in Nunavut themselves. And we will get researchers in the, in, in, to the communities from you know, southern universities, I won't name which ones, but they would come for the summer and they would do their study and then say, this is the quota, this is the population, so this should be the quota. And, you know, they were talking about there's a big decline because of climate change. And again, there's conflict between indigenous people and researchers. So during our chairmanship, I said, let's develop the framework that would incorporate that in any research that we do. And I was heavily criticized for that policy initiative by researchers and saying that I am diminishing science because I wanted to incorporate traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge into that. Mm -hmm. And my position was, as far as I'm concerned, your research is not complete until you do so. And so that we're not a study from afar and that we are a partner in that and that information that you acquire through your research, those individuals should be acknowledged, just like you are acknowledged through your thesis or your PhD or, and so on. Um, heavily criticized media, where as a government against science, I think you've heard that through your past hats, um, was part of that. And, but today, um, today you hear it all the time we're going to incorporate indigenous knowledge and, uh, into this system. And, you know, I do recognize that it's not always possible to, to reconcile those two, but where it is possible, you put the effort in and you do that because you make a better rounded decision on the population you serve. So that would probably be one of the first things I would do as prime minister to, to look at things in that lens. Um, and 
be more inclusive, inclusive of the population we serve. Um, so I think we still have a lot to go, but around the polar bear um, issue, be happy to hear that we brought the people together <laughs> in Washington of all places um, to resolve that conflict. That was a very interesting few days of meetings, but we got there. In Washington. In Washington. <laughs> um, I brought in the Inuit from Alaska, Canada, and us, uh, myself as a de head of the delegation um, to resolve the government at the time that was trying to enlist the polar bears in the ancient species when we were dealing with an abundance issue. Um, so again, interest groups to latch onto a wildlife to demonstrate there was change in climate as opposed to studying those based on science. You know, and I'm, I'm reminded of, of uh, that saying, where you stand on something often depends on where you sit. Yeah. And so you would have that unique position on the Arctic position where, as you said, other people would look at it from a different lens. I, and uh, I often talk about my former teachers, probably because I was a teacher, <laughs> but I recall getting a map of uh, North America. We didn't know it was North America, but it was, you know, they just gave it to us and they said, you know, where's this? And it was, of course, they just gave us the map upside down <laughs> and we couldn't, nobody could figure out at the time. We were young kids and we couldn't figure out, well, where's, but it was just take a look at the perspective of, you know, you know, Canada doesn't necessarily go this way. It, you know, we have to look at it from another point of view, another perspective. It's so, so important to teach um, our young people today. Um, I mean, what you hear in the news or social media, it's, it's, that's not life in the North. It's not, it's so, it's a vibrant culture. It's a, you know, in my hometown of Joe Haven, they have the traditional drum dancing, singing, um, square dancing, fiddling. It's all part of that. And it's a vibrant culture that loves to laugh and share and families very close, very similar to what you see down here. And, you know, oftentimes you hear all the negatives. I mean, yeah, we do have our challenges, but um, the young people that I see today are so talented and eager to learn and contribute. Um, you know, you just need the levers to allow things to move forward and give them proper support. Um, I think we're in good hands, right? And more and more young people are uh, getting involved in roles where decisions are made. Um, and that's, that's important, and it's, it's going to be tough at times, but, you know, that's kind of how I started. I was frustrated things weren't getting done and got involved in volunteering, and next thing you know, it's, it's evolved to that. Like, it starts somewhere. Do you, do you ever get worried? I'm, I'm asking the question, no, sorry. No, it's good. This is exactly <laughs> what I wanted. I, this I mean, is what do, I said. Do you ever get worried that, on the whole conversation of reconciliation that there's too much discussion about neg negatives in that light, that not enough of those positive stories are being told because it's, it's getting consumed by the other things that, you know, I, I, I'm um, asking from an outside person looking, looking in, I guess. I think um, for me, I, I go back to what does reconciliation mean for me and my family? And how do we move forward? Because it's so big, right? And, and it means different things for different people and so forth. The history is longer for others. And so, if, you know, if we're going to make progress, it still has to be a bit manageable, right? And I look at it from my family side of things. How do we move forward? Uh, how do we deal? And so... I try to look at it that way in, in terms of um, going, uh, how we go forward. But at the same time, um, we're not telling the story of the success of Indigenous people. And if we're going to give hope to our young people, they need to also hear that. And, you know, with my son, when the graves and uh, unmarked graves were discovered. You know, he's 13 years old, and I sat him down and told him what happened and what the story is. And 
Um, you know, this is our history as Canadians, and it's really important to be able to have that safe conversation with your child to understand what happened if he is asked that question. And um, how did that impact him on an emotional level when you um, talk to him about that? I mean, that little guy seen a lot. I mean, he was in politics at three months old with me, and and I was saying to Rodney earlier that you don't realize. Um, how much children take in, and he's taken a lot and at a very young age of watching mom and um, being in politics. And, you know, I had to tell him a story about the shooting on the hill because I was there and explain to him and we did, the teachers at school, please don't talk about that because we haven't had a chance to talk to him because I didn't want him to be afraid to watch me go to work every day and that impacts him so in that within that kind of framework you know I have to explain to him in a way that this is the past it happened in the past I went to residential school I had to explain that to him and who else went to residential school in our family and um, but to keep the doors open for also for him to ask us me the questions that may be difficult um, but he knows that, like he, but that's not all children either, right? This is why it's so important to continue to have that conversation. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, embrace the success of our sister indigenous people. Right? It's, it's, you can't just have all the negative. You have to celebrate the successes of our people. And we're seeing that, you know, we have a, you know, card surgeon who's now working in Newfoundland, the first one from Nunavut, and the hockey players, the yeah. geologists, the nurses, doctors, lawyers, like singers, performers, cabinet ministers. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I think um, sharing those are so important today in that it gives the young people hope, right? You, you, it can't all be negative. I mean, negative is so, it can be quite depressing. Right, if if we just focused on that, but recognizing that we need a path forward as well, and to help our colleagues is just equally important. Um, but to also keep our young people uplifted is that much more important too. And that brings me to this place, back around to this place, because you know it celebrates the art and culture of so many different indigenous groups, and I'm. I'm guessing you were surprised to see so many that you knew. Is there a way that Rolf, and he asked me, you know, I was talking to him before we sat down and I said, is there anything particular you would like me to ask? And he said, I would like you to ask Leona if there's a way that she can suggest we can help more in the North. Um, I'm a, I've always been a big supporter of our artists in the, in, in the North. Um, particularly around the women that made the clothing with seal skin products and that whole big, bigger picture battle, but, um, but starting a promotion on Seal Day on the Hill, um, getting the political buy-in that it's safe and the understanding. Again, it's educating, right? Um, through the arts, um, I have lots of friends in the art um, in, this, like, in, in the North, I really think it brings a community together that um, of individuals can, that can be very proud of the products that they produce um, to be able to see other people wear the products that they produce, as an example, is just equally important because that money goes back to caring for your family, your children, um, it's buying livelihood. food. It's, it's a livelihood for, for many women who are not able to get a job because communities are limited. So sewing and producing products is very important. Um, as I men as well as men to provide, to go out hunting. And so I think when you look at Inuit art, you have to remember that it's in that context as well is that someone produces to provide for their family, their children, the hunter to go out hunting and buy ammunition and so forth. So, um, there's a story of the artists that produced it, but there's also the, the community's spirit story around 
that? How can we help more artists? Um, I was saying to Rodney and Roth, go to the Northern Lights trade show in Ottawa. It's an, uh, it happens every two years, but it brings Northern artists from the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Makivik region of Quebec, uh, Labrador. Um, and it brings those artists uh, into one place, and uh, as well as the business community. Uh, majority of the business community is Indigenous business community, a combination, and we showcase that in Ottawa. And that event is growing um, every year, and um, technology has really helped the North um, because it's always been really difficult to market your products. You know, it's even finding a printer to produce your flyer back in the day was challenging. You don't, the language barrier, the where do we find this printer and how do you market it international and so forth. So now you just throw it on Instagram. It's, it's the positive and, power of social yeah, media. The reach is huge. So that's been a real plus to many, many um, artists out there in marketing. I think um, within this region, and um, it's important to have some kind of Indigenous arts cultural show. Um, like I look in here, like these are just beautiful, beautiful products produced largely from population from Nova Scotia. And I've seen the impact of what Northern Lights trade show has had on Inuit artists. Um, throughout the north, and and I think those those kind of celebrations are, yeah. And the other thing that I will say, when go back to politics, in supporting indigenous artists, um, this was my pet peeve. Now, um, when you go through the airports, you go to the gift stores, you have all these fake carvings, like made in China. Made in China, Inuit carvings, right? Um, again, a population. Wow. That's our economy. Yeah. That's how we make our money. And now we have Canadian stores in our airports marketing fake Inuit arts, taking away a possible income of Indigenous artists. So um, one of the things I was getting involved in was to try and stop that to protect the integrity of indigenous artists in this country for us any but people don't look at it in that lens right great point right do you know that right now in nova scotia the mi'kmaq artists are in the process of creating an authenticity brand trademark mm -hmm. and loretta gould who whose Very work important. you'll see represented here and alan Silliboy are both involved in that actual emblem yeah it's so, so important. Um, and again, when I look at it from the big picture of the impact of the CO hunt and the other groups of our livelihood, and then I look at these fake arts, why, why not a different artist? Why not a Southern artist? Why, why an Indigenous artist fake art being sold in, in Canadian stores? Eh? So when you look at it from that context of from... from an indigenous person, I'm like, geez, this is taking away income yeah. uh, when jobs are scarce in many remote communities. So that's a good move that I think every jurisdiction should be looking at that. If you're looking at supporting indigenous artists through the center um, and northern artists, to start looking at it from that context as well. Well, I want to be a part of that trip to the Northern Lights to show. That sounds phenomenal. Really great. Bring your checkbook. Yes. <laughs> Mic drop. Thank you both so, so much. I can't thank you enough uh, for taking the time to have this conversation. And it's really, it's deep learning for me. And I'm privileged to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. We are friends united. We are friends united. We are friends united. Together, we are friends united. <laughs>